Hello community, so great that you are back. Today we have a look here at some crazy new AI research. Let's start and welcome to my channel Discover AI. So you remember in my last video we were talking here about a kill switch, but also in particular about an entropy adaptive fine tuning mechanism. And we finally understood here the gradient bombs that we have in catastrophic forgetting if we do some supervised fine tuning and we call them confident conflicts. Now guess what? This entropy adaptive fine tuning was just the first step because today we're gonna go a step further. We're not limit ourselves to the entropy, but we have a look at the general thermodynamic boundary, but now not of fine tuning alone, but now we go for reasoning. Now we go for logic, causal reasoning. So this is the paper of today, logical phase transitions, understanding a collapse in LLM logical reasoning. And you would say, hey, we have a logical collapse. This is interesting. So let's have a look. January 6th, the authors propose here a neurosymbolic curriculum tuning exercise. So this is a new framework that adaptively aligns the natural language with the logical symbols to establish a shared representation space. So this preprint will show us that the LLM reasoning does not degrade linearly if we increase the complexity of our task. Instead, the logic will behave like matter. It remains solid, this means stable, through a range of complexity. Then it will reach a melting point, a critical threshold, where the accuracy collapses abruptly into a liquid noise. And this is simply the random guessing by our LLM. So therefore the authors decided we need a new metric. We need something that we can measure. And they went here with an extrinsic metric and they called it the logical complexity metric, low CM. To complement here all the intrinsic metrics that you know from one of my last video, the CT prefix and here our entropy guild of T we discussed in my last videos. Now, the LOCM formula quantifies here complexity in a real simple way. Listen, they just went down and said, hey, let's do this, let's calibrate this, let's go with this formula. There's nothing really deeper inside into this. No? Our WOs are simply here the calibrated weights for the O operators like I will show you in a minute, and H is simply here the reasoning hubs. So for the weight one, we have the basic connectives. For the weight two, we have quantifiers and negation. For the weight three, this requires multi-branch implication handling. We have the conditionals and then the weight 3.5 they defined here. This is the highest tax that you have to pay. This requires explicit case splitting here. And this here, let's say exclusive or, and then the reasoning hops is simply here, two per hop. Great. Now they said, okay, so the first step is we have to measure the logical complexity of a particular task. This is our formula. We have the logical operators. Great. We have the operator occurrences, the frequency and the number of the reasoning hops as I showed you. Great. So now comes an interesting part. They say, let's combine this with natural language. But let's do this here already in a neurosymbolic alignment data set. So you remember in my video here where I showed you Google goes extreme here, they used here PTDL and tried to integrate it here into the LLM body here. PTDL, the planning domain definition language here, the physics engine or the rule book of a universe, they have here the domain file. And now they decided to go here with first order logic. And here you have it here, the first order logic notation here for the variable, for constant, for the operators, all the explanation here on the right hand side. Then we have our function, our predicates, and then we have our negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, biconditional, universal quantifier, existential quantifier, and you and everything that you know from logic, first order logic. And then they say, you know what, we make a mapping. We make a mapping from our linguistic elements here to first order logic. We define some translation rules. So you have here, for example, here a natural language example. Moriarty is a cat. How would this look like here in our first order logic? And here you see now the solutions. Beautifully. You do this for everything, implication, conjunction, disjunction, exclusive or negation, and whatever. Atomic reasoning, multi-step chain. And this is defined. So great. So you say, okay, instead of a pure natural language, so of a pure large language model, this model now is trained on operating here on a paired 
natural language and a first order logic data structure. So you immediately understand that now we're operating here on a shared latent manifold between an abstract logic and a human text and somehow this will become interesting. Now, if you say, wait a minute, so we had our PDDL and then we have now our first order logic. Yes, PDDL is effectively a specialized action-oriented implementation of first order logic. And here the authors use first order logic to measure the deductive reasoning complexity. And I will show you, uh, we will calculate an example at the end of this video. And PDDL uses a similar logic to define here the state space trajectories. If you want from biomedicine, your PDDL is often called a strips like language that relies here on FOL predicates to define here the world. So when an LLM translates now a prompt into first order logic, it is performing here if you want the same formalization of intent that is required to write here a PDDL domain file, explained in one of my last videos. So Simple example, imagine an AI is tasked with moving here some boxes in a warehouse. This is a classic PDDL task, no? So you give here the robot instruction, hey, put all the blue boxes on the top shelf, unless they contain class. Now, our symbolic form is here. This is here our symbolic form. Now, this is beautiful because this is now not anymore a pure, if you want, probabilistic form, but this is really almost a deterministic form, no? And now we have a special effect. And the auto show us if the number of the boxes and the nested condition like the not contains create here a particular complexity level, let's say of eight, doesn't matter. A small model like a JAMA 2 billion free trainable parameter model hits its phase transition boundary. It will still linguistically sound confident. Yes, I'm now moving the boxes. But its latent integrator here, our CT prefix from one of my last videos, will now spike because it can no longer maintain a solid logic for the for all x quantifier. So you see, we have now again some intrinsic signals coming out from our black box LLM. And the researcher discovered that the logical phase transition, or LPT, what they call it, on this combined manifold. So how did they do this? Well, they started here our LLM, a GPT, a QN, a Gamma model on natural language reasoning task. No? If Elise is a biologist and this happens, then you know. Now, the performance on this task seemed to drop sometimes unpredictably. So to the naked eye using just here the natural language, some of the longer sentences were easily solved, while some of the shorter sentences were almost impossible for some LLMs to solve. And then they did here the intelligent mapping. The authors mapped here this natural language task to their first order logic equivalents, the predicates and the operator, as I just showed you. And then they calculated here the logical complexity metric, the LOCM. And they discovered something. When they plotted now the model accuracy, the performance of a model on natural language task against the LOCM of the underlying first order uh, logic structure, the logic phase transition appeared. And here you have them. So you have here this for different models carefully. We, have, we start with a deep seek version 3, GPT 4.1 nano, a QN 2.514B, then a 32B, a gamma 1B, a gamma 4B, a gamma 12B, a gamma 27B. And you see there are in the shaded areas here, you see those are our logical phase transition. This are, if you want, the shaded region denote here the identified transition intervals where the accuracy drops here from a, let's say, normal shoulder here, a plateau, quite significant, and then it reaches here another shoulder, another plateau. So interesting, you might say. So we do have some, let's call it regions of instability in the reasoning process, then we have some stability, and then we have some instability. Now you see, depending here on the number of trainable parameters, that it is here, let's, where can we go there? There are some interesting points. I'll show you this in another uh, implementation. So they discovered now as a second step here, the logical phase transitions. These boxes, as I just showed you. And I said, okay, so now we can identify whenever we have an increase in the complexity of the task, 
the performance of the model will drop significantly. No? Here on the y-axis, we have the accuracy, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100%. And the more we make the task challenging, more complex in our defined metric, you see the performance goes below 50%, let's say here, for a deep seek model. But of course, you can go even deeper, <laughs> let's call it. And here the, da the dashed or dotted line is here, where the model is simply guessing. No, there's no reasoning anymore. This is just some guessing. And this is where reasoning stops. Okay, so the author decided, decided now to design a neurosymbolic curriculum tuning. Because they said, you know what? We are going to tune this now. Now that we know that we do have phase transition, we can take care in the training of those phase transitions. We will build bridges over this phase transition and increase the performance in this phase transition regions. So therefore, we will improve the overall performance and we will shift here to a higher complexity. And they did this in a very intelligent way. They had a two complementary component approach. The first was an adaptive neurosymbolic alignment for the learning of the hybrid semantics that aligned the language and the logic representation in our mathematical space. And then simply they went with a curriculum learning based on a complexity, a work curriculum, which shadows here our training examples from low to high logical complexity. So everything that we know, there's nothing special in this. And they had this neurosymbolic curriculum tuning, stage one and stage two, beautiful. And they said, okay, the recipe is rather easy. We first fine tune two baseline models independently. So the first model is a pure natural language model, here our theta natural language. And then we have a pure first order language model, here our theta first order language. And then we construct a family of hybrid models through a linear interpolation. Here you have it, 1 minus lambda, and you know this formula. And then for each interpolated model that we get out of this, now we fine-tune it on a specific neurosymbolic alignment data set. This is here available in the literature. And great, and we hopefully achieve the goal. Now let's have a look about the performance of this fine-tuned system. Is it really better? Have they shifted in a new higher complexity class? Let's have a look what happened. The limitations set in. Now the result was that the logical phase transition persists even under this huge amount of fine-tuning and even structured prompting. They said, okay, so let's do some chain of sort, some real complex chain of sort. No? And we have here temporary memory and we optimize this. Whatever you can imagine here with chain of sort prompting, delay, shift, whatever, nothing worked. Nothing here, neither the fine-tuning nor the chain of sort prompting delays, shift or eliminates here our instability zones, our phase transitions. But although both improve accuracy within the fixed complexity regime, the critical thresholds remain unchanged and the performance still collapses sharply beyond them. So everything that they achieved was just a little bit of improvement within a tiny little region. And you can see this here. So they achieved a little bit, yeah, they have here in blue the direct here and then they have the chain of sort uh, improved. No? And if they go then with their specific fine tuning, here this theta star direct and chain of sort and everything. And you see it's still more or less the same behavior. No? And the authors come to the conclusion with a lot of more data. Please read the original study. I just give you the result. This indicates that here our phase transition, our logical phase transitions, arise from intrinsic properties of current model architecture and the inference mechanism itself. And it is independent of fine tuning or chain of sort or whatever you think, tree of sort, whatever. It is inherent that we have, have a logical phase transition if we increase the complexity of the task. Now, I know that this is counterintuitive for the most researcher, no? Because this graph showed us that chain of sort provides a vertical lift, a little bit improvement in the accuracy within a stable regime. But it does not shift, if you want, the phase transition, like the melting point or the other point here, horizontally in the complexity region. So this proves that whatever you have under prompt engineering cannot overcome the structural limit of a model's logical depth. 
So if the model skeleton, the logical skeleton, is built from the pre-training phase onwards with its pre-training data structures for a particular, let's say, depth 8 complexity logic, you ought to say no amount of chain of thought will make it work reliable at a higher, like a depth 12 level. So you cannot increase the model complexity performance and shift it into a higher complexity level. This is not working. The phase transition will stay the same. Absolutely fascinating insight. I want to give you some examples. Because I told you, hey, a natural language prompt, here, a verbology studies here, whatever. So what we have to do? We have here, now, if we calculate here this LOCM parameter, and it is a scalar, so you have for all x and then the quantifier and then for the implication and for the exclusive or and you put everything into the formula, you get about LOCM about 7. But 7 is near the melting part, the phase transition in logic for the most 7b to 14b model. So this would indicate that this is already at the end of the capacity of the logic causal reasoning capacity of those LLMs. So we have suddenly with this metric a way to say, and you can optimize this metric for your particular model, to say, okay, we have to run the test, we have to find here our phase transition points, but then we know, and then I can more or less here deduct here from the text, only from the query, what model is able to solve it. This is a very nice result. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's make it real complex. No? So this is now here. This is just a pretext to say, okay, natural language here, and then here the first order logic, and does this, and does not this, and then first order logic is this one. And then we have a simple question. Based on the above information of all of this, what you see here, is the following statement true, false, or uncertain? And now they show us here, you can run here really in a seven-step reasoning trace that you have, whatever you have as a natural language, you can really map it into a first-order logic, step two, and you solve it for step by step by step, and you build upon it, and then you get an answer that is really correct. And the correct answer is, hey, the statement is false, the correct option is B. So they show us here if you now intertwine the natural human language with a first-order logic construct, this is a real improvement for an AI trying to solve here your human query. Now, I will go back and I will read this paper here from the Beijing University of Post and Telecommunication for the, street, the hallucination detection in long chain of thought reasoning. And I will read again the entropy adaptive fine tuning because I think there is some deeper connection between those papers and the current paper that we just looked here in this video. I can't tell you exactly what it is. I have to think about it, need an hour. But some from some corner in my brain, I get to, to hear the voice tells me Lee algebra. So I will try something with a Lee algebra, but yeah. More about this here in a later video. I just wanted to show you, unbelievable, no? This was published here January 5th. And this paper was published January 6th. So you see, from different corners of the world, MIT, Stanford, Beijing, wherever you are, they're all working here more or less on the same border, on the same limit of our AI knowledge, and they try to push it further. And we all encounter more or less the same effect of the limitations. But the way we see it, the way we develop specific metrics for analyzing those limitations is fascinating. And if you compare then two, three, four, five of this paper, so you get two, three, four, five different viewpoints, different frame, different framings of the same problem. And this helps me, for example, here to find here a new solution that will integrate all of the papers above. And maybe on a deeper level, you can find then a mathematical formulation that would explain all the effects that are described in those papers. So, if you have the time, hey, take an hour, read the paper. Maybe if you find it before me, please leave me a comment here in the description here of this video. I would highly appreciate it, and I guess the R community also. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was informative. Like, subscribe, become a member. I see you in my next video.